This video looks at efficient admissible set algorithms. So you will have gathered by now that dual mode algorithms require constraints to be tested over an infinite horizon. And while in practice this is equivalent to actually testing them over some finite horizon, such a finite horizon may be large and it may vary a lot with the chosen target or disturbance. Now admissible set algorithms are not an efficient way or might not be efficient way of capturing the large enough horizon, especially with large state dimensions. And what I should really have emphasized there is simple admissible set algorithms might not be appropriate. In practice, what we need is effective ways of eliminating all the redundant constraints as we go, because if we don't do that, we very quickly get a massive increase in the number of constraints we're carrying around that we don't need to, and the problems just become intractable. So what we're going to do here is we're going to introduce a more efficient algorithm and show that it can be applied to dual mode predictive control. So just to remind you of the key points, we express the predictions using some form of autonomous model like this, where X captures all the things that might vary. And we ensure that the limit as k goes to infinity of a to the k is 0. We express the constraints at each sample using linear inequalities, something like this, where f is strictly bigger than 0. And then <coughs> we find the admissible set takes this sort of form, where obviously our job is to find an appropriate f and appropriate t. Now, a critical requirement is to ensure convergence is that the asymptotic point, that is where the state tends to asymptotically, is strictly inside the MCAS and not on the boundary. Because if it's on the boundary, then what you might find is the algorithm does not converge. And therefore, what we need is the limit as k goes to infinity of x of k, which will give us x of s, the steady state. We want, if you put the steady state into your MCAS, then we want it to be such that the inequality is satisfied, such as this, f x s is strictly less than t minus epsilon, where epsilon is some small positive number. So how did we define our maximal admissible set? Well, what we said is, as long as you took a large enough horizon n, then the admissible set could be given as g a, so in fact that's Mr. G, G, G A, G A squared all the way down to G A to the N less than or equal to F. And the way you can test whether N is large enough is you do this optimization here. You maximize over X, G A to the N plus 1 X, subject to F X less than or equal to T. And in essence, what you're trying to do is you're trying to force this to be, um, if I put not less than or equal to to f. So if you can force that to be the case, then n is not large enough. If you can't force it to be the case, then n is large enough. So that was your basic maximal admissible set. But the problem is, within here, you could have a lot of redundancy, which essentially means a lot of the rows might not be needed. So the number of inequalities can grow very quickly with n. Again, we'll put in here, we've forgotten the g at the top. So the basic algorithm is you start with, let's say we've assumed the horizon is n, but then it might go to n plus 1, and then you might go to n plus 2, and so on. And every time you increase n, you see you're adding a lot of extra inequalities. So if g had 10 rows, every time you increase the horizon, you've added another 10 inequalities. In practice, although we need to increase the horizon, what we're going to find is <coughs> many of the earlier rows are redundant, and it helps our life if we remove them on the go. We don't wait to the end. We actually say, I already know that lots of these rows are redundant. Let's get rid of them before I carry on, because that will make my life a bit easier. And the other thing we can do is we can look at just adding one row of g a to the n plus i at a time, rather than adding them as blocks. But we'll show this next. So here's an alternative approach. And what we're going to do is consider the problem slightly backwards. You won't see the difference particularly. So what I'm going to do is define the sample constraints like this. And you'll notice I've already put f and t in here, because what I'm saying is that this is a possible 
F and T, and I'm going to seed that using the original sample constraints of G and F. I'm going to note my autonomous model predictions are given by a form like this, xk plus 1 equals xk, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say what constraint on xk ensures that xk plus 1 also meets these sample constraints. And this is what you end up with. What you find is xk obviously meets the sample constraints if you have f less than or equal to t, and xk plus 1 also meets the constraints if you have fa less than or equal to t. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to treat this new set of inequalities as my new f and t. Now you might say I, you can't see much difference here, but remember we're going to iterate this slightly differently because what you're going to do now is you're going to take this new f and this new t and you're again going to write f, f, a, t, t and so on. Now you might be saying, golly, I'm going to get a massive explosion in dimension here, but we've got another subtlety to come. So that's just the principle of how we're going to move things forward in time. What you'll notice if you look at this carefully is we've started with some inequalities like this and then what we've done is we've said let's add on rows like G1 transposed A, G2 transposed A and so on all the way down to Gn transposed A less than or equal to F and we've said what I'm going to do if I'm happy that I want all of those is I'm going to rename this as Gn plus 1 I'm going to need rename this one as g n plus 2. I'm going to rename this one. It will be as g 2 n. So you've got a sort of renaming process going on. Now that's quite important because what you'll see is that I can now look at this as adding just one row at a time because I could have just added this block and then if I wanted it, call it g n plus 1. And then I could have added this block and if I wanted it, call it gn plus 2. And then so on down, added this block. And if I wanted it, call it g2n. And that's the subtle difference. What we're going to be doing here is just adding one row at a time. So here's the basic iteration. We start from here with our sample constraints. Step one, we just add a single extra row, g1 transposed a. And what we say is, is this row needed or not. So we retain it only if it's active. If it's not active, we get rid of it. But what I'll do now is I'll just assume we need it. Then step two, now I add G2 transposed A and again say is this active, do I need it and so on. Now you can very clearly see what's going on here. Each step I'm just adding one extra row and checking it. If I now take myself a long way forward up to step R then in step R, obviously what I'm going to be adding is GR transposed A. And you'll see this a very simple iteration here that I just add one row at a time. How do we terminate? Well, there's going to come a point where R equals M. You'll notice I've got an M down here, which is how many constraints I've already got, and an R, which is which step I'm at. Now, you remember, not every time you add a row do you keep it. Sometimes you add a row and you say, no, that's not needed, it's redundant. And therefore, the size of your F will not increase. And so eventually, R will equal M. Now, if R equals M and the row that you're proposing to add is redundant, then you've got no more checks to do and you have finished. Now, the other thing that we want to do is we want to clean out redundant rows from time to time. And I'm not going to say exactly how often, but on a periodic basis, you want to go through the whole set of inequalities and say, do some of these rows now become redundant because of rows that I've added later? So we've provided a file for you. It's called construct underscore MAS. And what you should notice, this is modified from an original file by Bert Ploimers. If, when you run this file, you seem to be not getting convergence, if it's going on and on and on, then the usual error is your state transition matrix A has not got stable eigenvalues. And that's something you should check if you want to before you start. And the other thing is the code does not check for feasibility, so it may be that you're just infeasible to start with.
You'll notice the structure of the code. It takes the transmission matrix A and the sample constraints G and F. So here's a simple example. Video 514, example 1. And we'll go and look at the MATLAB in a minute. And this one had very simple sample constraints, which were just basically your box constraints and a simple dynamic. And you'll find if you put this into the code, it tells you the MCAS is just a little bit smaller on these corners. But the key thing is only eight inequalities. It stripped out all of the redundant ones that you didn't need. If I now look at video 514 example 2, this is a similar example, but we've added quite a lot of other stuff on this so you can see what's going on. The original sample constraints, there they are, they go plus or minus 10, but when you calculate the MCAS, you can see it's much smaller. The MCAS is inside here, and if you're not convinced, what you can do is you can say, alright, let's assume that I start at some point here which obeys the sample constraints. But you can see the first iteration takes you outside the sample constraints. So clearly, this point here cannot be inside the MCAS. You could take another example here. If I follow the predictions, it goes outside the sample constraints. So the original point cannot be in the MCAS. And you can see that for several of these points. <coughs> so many areas which are inside the sample constraints are not inside the MCAS because they lead to state evolutions which violate the sample constraints. However, if you go inside the MCAS, so let's take this point here, you see the first point is also inside the MCAS, so that's okay, as are the future points. If you take a different one, let's say this value here, you can see it evolves and it keeps you inside the MCAS. And that's basically how your MCAS is defined. If you start inside it, you must stay inside it. And you can see that this particular um, software for finding the MCAS is working. And the nice thing is, again, you'll notice only 10 inequalities. All the redundant ones have been stripped out. If you look at video 514, example 3, this has got three states. Here, you've got the sample constraints. And over here, you've got the MCAS. Now, you'll notice the MCAS is a lot, lot smaller than the sample constraints in this case. And the other thing we've done is we've deliberately chosen an asymmetric constraints originally. Can you see here I've got a minus 4 and a 1? And you'll notice with all the constraints here, this one goes from 1 to minus 3. So what we've done is we've chosen asymmetric constraints just to demonstrate there's no problem. And your MCAS has a rather unusual shape. Now, if you want to look at these, pieces of code and run them yourself. If I can find them somewhere. Oh, that's not the one, but we'll get there in a minute. Uh, there it is. So for example, video 514, example one, you'll see it's a simple state transition, simple sample constraints, straight into construct MAS, and then a plot. So I can run that, and there it is, nice and simple. So you can test it yourself. Example two, very similar, I can run it and it generates the plot in seconds. So if you want to change the numbers and see what's going on, you can do it yourself. Video 514 again, and that one took a little bit longer. You can see there's lots of um, messages going in here from the construct MAS telling you which constraints it's adding, maybe which ones it's removing, and so on, until it converges. And then it generates these two plots. So you can go and play around with this code if you want and do your own examples. Now, next what we want to do is look at dual mode or SOMPC. Now, in this particular case, there was a subtle difference. You'll remember that we split the constraints into two parts, one to do with the R minus D term and one to do with the rest. And so what we said is some of the constraints had to be satisfied for all K and some of the constraints only had to be satisfied at k equals 0. And so what we need to do is just modify this algorithm that we've just taken and make sure that when we start the iteration, we only iterate on the rows in G2 and we don't iterate on the rows 
in G1. So we just start the iteration a few rows later, but otherwise you can see it's exactly the same algorithm. And then we can apply this for the dual mode. So the particular code we've given, there it is, you'll see the only difference is that now you have to supply G1, G2, F1 and F2 so the code knows which rows to iterate on and which rows not to. Now what's the difference? Here, you'll see this is the same as example 1, so this is what you got when you did example 1. And if you look here at example 4, you'll see it's now got an additional state. And this additional state is the R minus D term. Now in this particular case, the shape seems to be the same if you take any slice on R minus D. You've got two more inequalities, which basically are the limits on R minus D. You take example 5, which is the same as example 2, and again you'll see we've got an extra dimension here now, and this is the R minus D term. Again, just 12 inequalities, but the key thing here is what we're showing is that it does converge. It does what you expect, it works. There's also an example 6, which is the same as example 3, but we can't plot this because it has four states. Um, and again, you'll see the MCAS ends up with two extra constraints associated to the inequalities, which are linked to R minus D. So a warning. Now, this is quite important because if you're writing this code yourself, there's lots of silly mistakes you can make and get confused about. If you look at the autonomous model for OMPC, which was looked at in the previous video, if you want to go and check it, you'll see that the middle block had states based on C, K plus I. But the key thing is, if you look at something like C, K plus 1, you'll see it does not affect, that should be affect, shouldn't it, X, K plus 1. Now that's quite important because what it means when you're doing your minimization is that you can end up with unbounded values for C, K plus 1 when you start off with the initial sample constraints because the initial sample constraints do not depend on C, K plus 1 and therefore C, K plus 1 can be whatever it likes. And so you can get some unbounded results from your linear program. So you need to make sure you've got suitable error catching within your code to deal with subtleties like this. Otherwise, you can easily get incorrect results. So a summary. This video has shown how more efficient admissible set algorithms can be coded. And a key part of this algorithm is the addition of just one new row at a time. And secondly, there's a need to have regular checks for and removal of redundant constraints so that you don't get an explosion in the number of inequalities that you're carrying around. What we'll do in the next video is we'll actually apply this to SOMPC or MPC and show you how the three algorithms <coughs> we've discussed in these videos um, vary.